My name is Andy. I'm going to talk a little bit today about mobile growth and specifically some of the tech choices that um, you would face if you're building a mobile mobile product. Um, basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about like present a framework um, for mobile growth, which we call the mobile growth stack. But I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. Um, you can read more about that uh, on our blog. But uh, what I'm going to focus on today is that what we call the tech layer, which is something new that we added in, in 2017. Um, which really kind of um, helps to kind of um, <coughs> it, these are like components which which are, and choices that you you need to make in order to sort of set up your app for for growth and sort of enabling technology which allows you to do cool stuff and fun stuff like on on the on the uh, the rest of the growth stack. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to myself just and uh, and to feature which is the. The consultancy that uh, I now work with, that uh, with Moritz, who's uh, at the back there. Um, yep. So my name's Andy. As I said, uh, I've worked uh, four and a half years at SoundCloud in the, the growth team there. Uh, I was leading a, a cross-functional team focused on on retention. Uh, my background's mobile. Um, I started out as a developer. I made a game called Space Impact for the Nokia 3310 back in uh, 1999, um, and I've basically been working in mobile uh, for the last 16 years. So it's it's pretty much all I know. Um, uh, but at some point, I sort of crossed over to the dark side from from being a developer to uh, to the sort of marketing side, and that's kind of where I'm now sort of applying my my expertise as uh, as part of Feature with um, with my colleague Moritz. Um, so at Feature, we basically we help companies with uh, mobile apps and mobile products. We help them to grow. Um, we typically work with uh, companies that are. Um, <coughs> A little bit sort of later stage, like sort of not, um, you know, that they already have found that this product market fit, and they are, um, you know, maybe struggling to get to that next phase of growth. Maybe they're trying to raise uh, the next funding round, um, or that they're, you know, maybe experiencing very strong growth on on web, but seeing a lot of their traffic like trans, um, like moving over to mobile, and they really need to kind of get up to speed on on mobile. And and so our, our focus is mobile growth, and and that's that's what we help people with. Um, so yeah, just before I dive into the the whole kind of topic of like growth and and tech choices for growth, um, just wanted to sort of set the scene a little bit and sort of explain why mobile um, is you know it's so important, but also that why it's why it's so difficult actually, and and why it, why it's such a challenge, and why it's important I think to think holistically and to use a framework like the mobile growth stack um, to think holistically about the kind of choices you're going to make because it's it's a really Tough market, actually. Um, so yeah, um, mobile. It's it's not really about any one specific device. Um, it's more about like the lifestyle, right? It's about this like always on, always connected, location aware. Um, although these people don't actually look like they're aware of their physical location, but their their devices are at least. Um, yeah, and it's really this um, this kind of lifestyle where like if you do it right. Um, these are some really old stats from Twitter. It's like it's not so much about Twitter this slide, but more about <coughs> really understanding the opportunity for mobile, which is really the opportunity to be with the user throughout their whole day. And you know, if you can be, um, you know, in that kind of consideration set of like apps which the user is using throughout their day, they're going to use it all the time. Um, but that's also a huge challenge because they can't be using everybody's apps all of the time. Um, oh, yeah, we've got a just quick slide here about shopping. Um, yeah, it's like it's also um, a Increasingly huge part of like people's buying decisions, and even if they're in like um, bricks and mortar stores, which is what this this slide is all about, um, you know they may they may still be actually making purchases on their mobile or assisting those purchases with their mobile devices. So um, yeah, it's like mobile is increasingly about commerce as well. Um, and yeah, if um, <coughs> if you're talking about think about mobile as like something that's you know in the future, something that's coming, then you are already living in the past, 2013. Uh, to be exact, like that's really when mobile really kind of reached the tipping point. So, like I think nowadays, like it's not really a consideration. Like, should we build a mobile product? You know, is is mobile relevant? I, I think those kind of conversations have kind of already already passed at this point. Um, in fact, you know, in Western markets, we sort of reached this kind of saturation point almost. Like growth, there's still growth there in smartphone sales, but there's definitely reducing. Like uh, in terms of the growth, the growth is still pretty healthy in developing markets. Um, and yeah, but but most people in Western markets, they typically have like a couple of cell phones by now, a couple of a couple of smartphones, maybe also a tablet. Um, <coughs> yeah, so just to sort of set the scene, I've, I've 
shamelessly stolen these slides from uh, Kleiner Perkins, by the way, but they are, they are attributed. Um, some of the slides I've, I've realized on, in this presentation, I haven't put the, uh, the credits for the images and things. So I, wh when I share these out, I'll, uh, I'll include a full list of like where I've got these images from. Um, yeah, this, um <coughs> this slide really just, I think, ho hopefully like illustrates the point that, uh, you know, actually the, the current state of mobile, it's really about Android. Like Android is massively dominant. Um, and that's something that people don't always appreciate. I think it, when they're in this kind of westernized bubble, everyone's walking around with an iPhone. I mean, I've got an iPhone in my pocket as well. Like, it's quite easy to kind of assume that everyone's got an iPhone uh, when, when you just look around and you see that actually most of your, your peers have an iPhone. Actually, it's not the case. If you think about it globally, like iPhone is a niche. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty profitable one, but it's still a niche. So um, this kind of leads into this, this whole kind of tech choices thing. I, I, one choice that I'm not even really kind of covering today is like whether you should build for, for iOS or Android or both. And I would say like at this point, definitely both. Um, or if you just choose one, then just choose Android. Yeah, uh, mobile ad spend still increasing, um, <coughs> whereas like yeah, non-mobile ad, ad spend absolutely flat. Um, so again, there's like a large opportunity actually to monetize on your mobile apps through through um, through advertising as well, and that's something that I'll, I'll talk to talk about in the the sort of monetization section. Uh, yeah, and just like to reiterate this kind of uh, this fierce competition thing here, let's take a look at the the iOS top charts and also the Android top charts. These are from March, but I mean they they don't change that much actually. Um, and actually, if you notice, if I flip between the screens, you don't notice that much changing either. At least in the top in the free free apps category, um, we see that um, yeah, basically uh <coughs> it's dominated by you know a couple of key players. It's like it's messaging apps, it's WhatsApp, it's Snapchat, um, <coughs> and it's uh, yeah, it's Google and Facebook. Basically, Google and Facebook properties are like you know dominating. So Instagram's a Facebook app, um <coughs> and yeah. So basically, if you want to be in the top ten free apps, then you're basically competing with Google and Facebook. Is is my point. Uh, in the grossing section, it's all games and dating apps. Um, so again, you, you're competing with people who are spending sort of six-figure monthly marketing budgets like to promote their games. So again, very fiercely competitive. The paid app category has a bit more dynamism to it. Um, and really, it's yeah, I'd say there it's it's a bit more um, open to you know a good app getting in there. But paid apps are a very small percentage of the overall like piece of the pie. In fact, like, you know, most of the, the games that are monetizing the best are actually uh, their freemium games, which is uh, what you see on the, on the right there. So they're, they, have a, they have a free tier, basically. They're not, they're not paid to play. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just to sort of really hammer home this point about you know, competing with, with Google and Facebook, um, yeah, this, this is some stats about the mobile user. Sorry for the, uh, the, the poor quality of the image there. But uh, it's basically what, it, what this says is that you know, 80% of app usage is, is in three apps. Um, in the USA, that's Facebook, Chrome, and YouTube. And worldwide, that's Facebook, WhatsApp, and Chrome. So in, in the worldwide, that's Facebook are owning two of those, you know. Um, <coughs> and in the, in the US, it's like Google are owning two of them, Facebook owns the other one. So what I'm saying is, if you're building a mobile app, a mobile product, just quick show of hands, actually, like how many people here in the audience have a mobile product or are building a mobile product right now? Okay, so about half. Yeah, and so basically, whether you like it or not, you're going up against Google and Facebook, uh, which is you know pretty terrifying prospect. Um, <coughs> which is yeah basically where uh, this framework comes in uh, called the Mobile Growth Stack. This is basically something that uh, I initially published back in 2014, and now I work on with Moritz uh, as part of Feature. Um, we publish new versions of this every year, um, and it's basically our attempt to kind of. Uh <coughs> kind of conceptualize like the levers for growth and put this into some kind of framework that allows people to, helps people to, to think about growth holistically and to build a mobile growth strategy. Um, so this was the very first version. Um, it's actually refresh refreshingly simple. When you see the newer version, you'll see it, it got a little bit more complex. Um, but basically, uh, this, this, this version is actually quite easy to, to sort of talk through. So I'll just give, give you a very quick tour of the, the mobile growth stack. Um, <coughs> so you've got, you kind of, three kind of core business goals like down the side or the three kind of core funnel steps acquisition retention and monetization being your kind of like core business objective so you get get users in retain them and hopefully monetize some percentage of them um, and these are the kind of activities which you might actually um, or, or levers in each of those layers that might actually be able to drive like uh, 
growth or like KPI like increases within within those those sections within those layers. Um, international is is a a vertical layer which is uh, like a like considered like a multiplier or a catalyst. Like so, basically, if you do international well, if you can grow in new markets, if you can support locally relevant payment methods, if you are you know um, translating your app and, and your app store presence and your marketing into the into the relevant uh, customer languages, then you can sort of multiply like your um, effectiveness and your growth across all of these layers. And it's all underpinned by like uh, world-class analytics. So uh, we'll talk about analytics a little bit more later when I talk about the kind of tech choices that you'll, you'll, make, you'll face when, when building an app. Um, <coughs> but yeah, the idea basically being that if you can't measure things, then you can't improve them. So the mobile growth stack uh, was originally first published in, in 2014. Um, since then, it's kind of been quite widely adopted within the industry. This is Gram, Gram Games using uh, the mobile growth stack to drive their, their development process of new games. They're, they're a game studio in Istanbul. Um, they've had some games in the, uh, the top grossing charts. Uh, Greylock Partners over in, uh, in the Bay Area, they, uh, they ran a, a workshop for their portfolio companies based on um, using the, the mobile growth stack as a kind of inspiration for that getting their, their um, portfolio together to talk about the tools and the tech stack that they'll use, which is yeah, wh what I'm going to be talking about today later. Um, this is a really bad blurry photo, but it's, uh, I was over at HealthTap in uh, Palo Alto, and they have uh, the growth stack on their wall there. They're, they're also using it to plan their growth activities. Uh, and Google um, borrowed our framework uh, with our permission. Like they, um <coughs> this is, again, terribly Poor, poor quality image, but um, basically they uh, for their Google Playtime event where they bring in all of their kind of top developers, um, they do these events all around the world, um, and they presented as part of that day, um, their developer day, they presented the uh, the mobile growth stack. They kind of made a Googlified version of it. I actually quite like their version. They kind of you know made it all kind of relevant to Google's products and services. But um, yeah, they uh, yeah it's a great endorsement and uh, um, yeah great um, yeah validation of the the model. So yeah, this is the, the latest version of the mobile growth stack. I apologize that it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex. Um, yeah, you can read all about this at mobilegrowthstack.com. I'm not going to go through the whole stack now. Like, uh, in fact, I'm not really going to go through any of the stack now, apart from this bottom layer, the tech layer, which is what I want to talk about today. Uh, so yeah, this layer down here. Uh, so this was something that we added new in 2017, um, basically to, to kind of <coughs> acknowledge the fact that there's there's a kind of an underlying layer of like enabling technology um, which companies will either need to build or buy uh, usually buy I would say but there, there are some exceptions to that um, in order to sort of provide like this this enabling technology this um, this kind of it's like a prerequisite to doing work in the rest of the stack so um, your analytics SDK or your analytics setup is going to be pretty fundamental to you doing anything in the analytics and insights layer for example um, having um, a marketing automation SDK or like using some kind of marketing automation service to do push notifications, emails, in-app messages, things like this is going to be pretty critical if you want to drive like more engagement and retention in the, uh, in the engagement and retention layer, for example. Um, so yeah, um, this, is, this is the layer I'm going to go through today um, and basically give some examples of like uh, some of the tools and technology out there and, and, and some of the pros and cons of like different uh, choices that you might need to make. Now, uh, feel free to like throw up hands and, and ask questions as I go along, but I will leave some time at the end also for, for some Q&A. Okay, so yeah, this was the, the tech layer as we added it to the stack. It's, it's relatively simple. There's, there's, just, there's just a few elements there, um, but there are very like many other ways to sort of conceptualize this, um, this kind of tech space, like this kind of underlying tech and this enabling technology. Um, this was another way that I went about like kind of drawing it, trying to sort of add the different tech components to the different like main layers of the stack. Um, this is uh, this is a ver um <coughs> this is a stack which uh, it's called the, the the UA mobile mobile UA stack. I think it is um, uh, Eric Soifert, uh, like friend and colleague of mine over at Mobile Dev Memo, um, recently published this. This was like his attempt to sort of conceptualize the, the sort of marketing tech space, so sort of with a, with a focus on mobile performance marketing. Um, he's written about that over at Mobile Dev Memo. You can, you can read all about that there. And uh, yeah, this is, um, 
the m particle periodic table of SDKs. Like this is like, as I say, you can go into like quite a lot of detail here if you want to really kind of. This is the most granular. Um, it's a really nice um, attempt actually to map the whole kind of SDK space. Um, so basically, it goes from sort of really techy tools and developer tools, things like crash reporting and data pipelines down on one end, to like super, super like marketing stuff like web DMPs and tag managers up on the right. Um, so they're really trying to map the whole ecosystem there. Um, but yeah, it's also a lot to take in. So yeah, we went with something like, you know, much, much more lightweight for the, for the mobile growth stack. It's, it's complicated enough. So we just tried to sort of distill it down to some sort of key tech choices that you might need to make. And that's, that's basically what I'm now going to talk about. So yeah, before we actually get into the, the elements in that tech layer, um, there's probably a couple of things. If you're building a, a mobile product from scratch, I already talked on the, the Android versus iOS and, and whether to you know, support one or either of those or both. Um, <coughs> but then, so the next question would be like, assuming that you're going to support at least Android or iOS, um, I'm not even going to talk about BlackBerry and Windows Mobile, by the way, at this stage. <laughs> like, yeah, let's, let's just leave those out of it. Um, <coughs> Yeah, um, assuming that you're going to support at least um, iOS and Android, um, you know, the question is, do you, do you build cross-platform or do you build native? Now, a couple of years ago, if you were going to build a cross-platform solution, and I, I saw a lot of these, you know, uh, particularly when it was like early stage startups, you don't have much development resources, like cross-platform was like a, you know, an attractive option from a, from a like resource point of view, but the results were pretty shitty, quite frankly. Like, you know, they were kind of like worst, of both worlds, kind of lowest common denominator apps, like often sort of just like kind of look like web apps in a basically a, a, a container. There's uh, like technologies like PhoneGap, which has, has come a long way in, in between. But, um, you know, you could build a, a workable app that would run on both devices, but it, would, it wouldn't really look like an iOS device or an Android, uh, a, an iOS app or an Android app. It would just look like kind of a web app. Um, and yeah, as a result, like, you know, uh, you definitely never get any featuring from from Apple or from Google, but you know maybe you can get your product out to market and ship it and like you know actually be able to iterate on it quickly. So I'm not saying it was always like a terrible choice. Um, sometimes I think it was the, probably a, re a decent choice. But like the good news is that like actually it's come a long way since then. You've got technologies like React Native, um, Unity, which is huge in games. Like pretty much all all the top games are like you know, built in in Unity these days. Um, <coughs> React Native um, at SoundCloud, we built the uh, the creator app SoundCloud Pulse in React Native. Uh, first of all on Android, and then very quickly we were able to deploy the uh, the iOS build, like using a lot of a, like a shared code base. Um, so yeah, really um, these days it's not about you know the the choice is not if you go for cross platform that you're getting like a really like terrible like lowest common denominator version, it's, it's not the case anymore. Things like React Native, you can actually build really nice performant apps that look and feel really native. Um, so I'd say like the cons is more that like, you know, you might have some lack of control if issues. You might have situations where the bug is in the platform rather than in your code. So you actually have to wait for them to issue a platform fix in order to actually get your app to work. And that's, or, or you have to like spend a lot of time like working around bugs in the platform. So it's like you don't have like the ultimate control as a developer. Um, but I think more importantly, maybe it's, it's probably the key thing is about this inter interoperability. Um, and this is like why we put the tech layer in the, the mobile growth stack this year is like to really kind of encourage thinking about like all of the kind of underlying tech that you're going to build into your app, like that's going to support your marketing and growth efforts. Um, if you think about that holistically, you might actually, it might actually influence your decision on whether to go cross-platform or native because it might be that your cross-platform um, development environment doesn't support all of the SDKs that you want to integrate with it. So for example, Segment, which I'm going to come on to in a second, um, you know, doesn't currently support React Native, uh, at least not out of the box, like there are some unofficial versions, but you would you'd basically have to be taking a bit of a leap of faith to go with like a React Native app and then try and integrate Segment with it. So might be that actually some of the third-party tools and technology that you want to use doesn't play nicely with your cross-platform development environment. Um, so that's another consideration. So yeah, I mentioned Segment. Um, so Segment is a multiplexer, or at least that's, that's what I call it. I'm not sure what they call it. Um, a data layer, I think, maybe. Um, but th basically the idea is that um, <coughs> if you use a multiplexer, 
um, you can basically collect all of your data that you're collecting from the app, like all of your events and properties and user attributes, all of your all of the stuff that you would normally send to your analytics SDK and maybe also to your attribution SDK, uh, maybe to your marketing SDK, uh, maybe to three or four other SDKs. You send it once to your multiplexer and then the multiplexer sends it like server to server to whatever other services and tools that you plug into it. Um, so that gives you a huge advantage in terms of agility. You can really try out services very quickly. Um, often without actually having to integrate a new SDK into your, your app at all. You just have the, the, the multiplexer SDK in there. Um, now that's, that's a simplification of the truth. Like if, you're, if you need to interact with the user, like with any kind of UI features, then you will still need to integrate another SDK. Um, but probably a much lighter weight integration because most of the, the data transfer is happening server to server. Um, that also gives you some advantages in terms of the amount of network usage that the app is using, so it should use less battery, less uh, less network, um, less data. Um, so yeah, um, but I think that the real advantage of using a, a multiplexer-like segment or uh, M particle, this is a pretty terrible diagram from M particle, but it's basically th it, trying trying to explain the same thing um, that you're basically sending your data once to like your data layer, which can then drop it into your own data warehouse and then to any other third-party tools that you want. Um, I think, say, really the main advantage of this, this kind of setup is the agility that it gives you, the ability to try out new tools and plug them in really, really quickly, um, which, yeah, can really help you kind of reconfigure your tech stack later uh, with minimum interference, because, like, when you're busy building features and rolling out new stuff, your developers are never really going to want to be integrating more SDKs. So it's, it's like a way to basically really speed things up. But, um, yeah, it, th but they're expensive. Like, not everyone can afford this these kind of multiplexes, but they are really cool. Like some of the best tech setups that I've seen use these, these multiplexes. Uh, deep linking. Um, deep linking is something which, like if you're coming from the web world, you might actually think, well, what, you know, what, what, e what even is it? Like, okay, it's like, it's linking to content within your app. Um, and in the web world, this is just, you know, it just works, right? You just have a URL, you have a hyperlink. Um, Deep linking um, on mobile, unfortunately, is, is still relatively complex. It works differently on Android than to iOS. Um, it's relatively, relatively simple to set up on, on Android, but you still need to kind of um, have your app like register to um, recognize domains, uh, or links from, from your domain, and then to map them to specific like, parts of your app. Um, on iOS, you have to set up yeah, something called a deep link schema. Um, and again, like at, a, at, a very, at the very least, you want to be making sure that it's possible with a deep link to, to link to all of the parts of your app, all of the screens or features that you actually might want to drive users to from, you know, for example, from an email campaign or from an advertising campaign. Um, so that's kind of basic deep linking and even that requires some you know, effort and some setup. And then if you want to do some really cool stuff like uh, contextual onboarding, which is, I'm just going to run you through this example, um, then you really need to, uh, to, to look at um, yeah, using some sort of third-party tools. Uh, uh, there's actually like uh, deferred deep linking now works more or less out of the box with uh, attribution providers. It's kind of one of their kind of services which which they kind of which comes with their their attribution services. Um, but there are some dedicated deep linking providers which which do it even better, like Branch and Yozio. Uh, I'm not sure who Pinterest uses actually. I think it was Yozio, but may maybe it's Branch. Um, but anyway, let me just run you through this example. Um, <coughs> So with Pinterest, this is their flow. So um, I got an email telling me about this new board, Piggies. I'm, I'm really into pigs. So um, yeah, the Pinterest suggested this to me. Uh, I click on the link. It actually doesn't send me straight to the app. It sends me to uh, the mobile web, which is what you see on the left here, de.pinterest.com. And uh, yeah, uh, so what I see here is basically like a preview of the board. And it looks like it's a full screen interest issue. It's basically driving me to the app. It's saying, works best on your iPhone, like hit continue. So if I hit continue, it would take me straight to the app store. But it does say here, scroll down to preview in your browser. Um, this is basically to get around like Google penalties for having big interest issues. So actually I can scroll down, which is what you see on the next page here and on the next page. Um, so I can scroll down and now it actually looks like I can interact with it just like I could, um, you know, like that it's, that it's a fully interactable Pinterest board, but actually if I then click on any of these images to try to actually access them, then it takes me straight over to the App Store and I have to install the app. But here's the, like, the real magic. Um, this, yeah, this is, uh, 
diagram here is from Branch. I'm not actually sure if Pinterest used Branch, but um, basically what it's doing here, it's quite subtle actually, but it's really nice. So the first time I run the app after installing, it's got this, uh, it's got a sign up wall, so it's like forcing me to sign up or create an account right away. Um, but it's showing me in the background these piggies, the piggies that I wanted to see. So in other words, it's persisting contextual information that it knows about what I was doing, what I was wanted to see prior to installing the app, and it's persisting that into my first session. So basically by doing this, they massively increase the number of signups that they get. Uh, because people see that the, the content that they, they want to see is, is just behind this sign-up wall. So that's one example. Uh, Uber do this as well. With uh, You can like start booking your trip on the mobile web. Then it like forces you to basically download the app so it's got like location tracking and you know uh, payments and all this stuff um, but then they can basically continue straight away uh, in the app uh, it like persists their booking information through so it's called deferred deep linking um, and in order to to have that set up like there you would want to use either your attribution provider or um, a dedicated deep linking product like branch or yozio so uh, i just mentioned attribution providers um, attribution is another thing which maybe you take for granted sometimes, I think, from the, from the web world that you kind of know where your traffic's coming from. Uh, on mobile, it's definitely not the case. Uh, in order to actually understand like, where your installs are coming from, which marketing channels are working for you, um, you need an attribution provider. So you need something like uh, Adjust, Apps Flyer, Tune, or Kachava. These are like the big four providers in that space. Um, if you're just doing Facebook marketing, for example, you might get away with just having the Facebook SDK installed but then it won't attribute your, your organics. You can't set up like trackers for all of your other links that you would put in emails and things like that. So it's really important to, to really understand as far as you possibly can where your installs are coming from on mobile so that you can invest more in those channels and activities that are working for you. Um, <coughs> yeah, so what you see on the left here is actually a, another example of how to do that. It's a bit more low tech. It's not like doing fingerprint matching or, or device matching to see who's clicked on a particular link or a particular advertising campaign, but it's like it's a how did you find us survey. Um, so I can't remember which app this comes from, but uh, <coughs> it's a really smart way of like helping to better understand the huge bucket which is still attributed as organic. Because even if you set up links on like, if you set up tracker links and with your, with your attribution provider for like all of your like main marketing links, you'll still find that there's a big chunk of your traffic which is just tagged as organic because it's people that just found you somehow through the App Store. Maybe it's through search, maybe it's because you, they were browsing a category, maybe you were featured. Uh, and it's really important to understand as far as possible like what percentage is, is of your traffic is coming from which. So that's what attribution is all about. And it's, um, yeah, it's unfortunately, again, it's, it's something which you actually have to really think about and make like, conscious decisions about uh, what tech to go for in, in the mobile space. And, and you have to pay for it as well. Um, analytics SDKs. Now, I've, I've put SDKs in, in most of these boxes in the text, tech layer, but actually, in some cases, you don't need necessarily to install a third-party SDK. Does everyone know what an SDK is, by the way? Uh, I'm assuming. Okay, I'm getting a, a shake of the head. Um, so an SDK is, uh, stands for Software Development Kit. It's basically when you are using a, a third-party piece of software or third-party service, um, you need to integrate um, some of their code into your app when you deploy it to the store. So it's like it, you basically bundle that code with your app. It becomes like a part of your app, basically, which does certain things. Usually it communicates with this third-party service in some way. So for example, my attribution SDK um, fires off an event to my attribution provider when the app is first launched. And, and then it, it has a look at something on their server and tries to work out like which uh, marketing campaign this user came from. Uh, with analytics SDKs, they're firing off um, events and behavioral data um, that you'd like trigger when, when users do certain actions within the app. Um, they're sending them off to the, the, the analytics provider. So, so yeah, um, I've, I've put SDKs here as like kind of all of these things in, in the, the tech choices, but actually you, you could build your own analytics system, in which case you wouldn't need to in integrate a, a third party SDK. I wouldn't advise it. Um, you'll spend a lot of time building analytics and it will probably be like considerably worse than some of the off-the-shelf packages which are actually pretty reasonable. I think Flurry is even free um, but still if you if you want to build your own like uh, you, you can do and that goes for like pretty much all of the, the tech choices as well. It's not a case that you have to license like a third-party pro um, product for each of these these tech choices 
Uh, attribution, I think it's pretty hard to do it on your own because they have to integrate with like every network. But uh, pretty much all of the others, you could technically build it yourself. I'm, I'm not a big fan of reinventing the wheel myself, but technically you could. Um, yeah, so when I talk about analytics, um, analytics is pretty broad, right? It can mean a lot of different things. So here I'm just talking really about uh, behavioral analytics. So sort of strictly quite actionable stuff. Like the difference would be like, so dashboarding and data visualization, typically it's kind of fairly static views of data, more for like internal company reporting and maybe investor reporting. Things like your, you know, your top line growth numbers, um, just sort of like key engagement metrics, like how things are progressing, like just to get a, get a good like snapshot of your numbers. And then your behavioral analytics, it's typically, it's more stuff that you actually would want to turn into action. So it's things like trying to understand how your users are interacting with the product better so that you can segment them in a more meaningful way or um, go out and find more of the users who are engaging with the product best or monetizing best, like by building lookalike audiences or something like this. It's typically more actionable and it's typically more sort of investigative work. Whereas your data visualization stuff, it's more just like, I want to see what our numbers are looking like today um, and maybe how they're trending over time. And quite often, like you can, particularly as like when you're starting out, you don't necessarily need two different products for these. Like typically like companies, when they're a bit bigger, they tend to have two products, like one for behavioral analytics, maybe another one for marketing automation, which I'll come to in a minute, and maybe another product for dashboarding and data viz. But in the early days, like you can, and, and maybe even in, in later days, you can get away with using a, <coughs> like a fairly full featured product like Amplitude, which has actually pretty good dashboarding stuff out of the box. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so like some of the stuff that you would want to be able to do with your analytics tool, for example, is things like uh, setting up conversion funnels and maybe like building, you know, arbitrary conversion funnels that you decide, okay, today I want to look at X and, you know, for the next week we're going to try and improve X. Um, so in this case, like this example, it's uh, the sign up flow. So if you wanted to get more people like to sign up, like there are all, all kinds of experiments you might want to run, um, but you need to be able to measure that stuff and actually see how many people are like, um, you know, getting through that funnel and, and where are they dropping off. So being able to create like arbitrary funnels and do cohort analysis uh, to see like how users are being retained over time. These are kind of like core components of growth and like pretty much fundamental to being able to do any other kind of growth work. Yeah, just some other examples there, like on the left kind of dashboarding that I'm talking about. You can do this in, you know, dashboards like this also in Amplitude and, and, and similar products. You don't need necessarily to, to build your own dashboards on top with a different tool. Um, and yeah, uh, talking about like um, <coughs> actionable stuff, I mentioned o audience segmentation earlier. Um, the example down there is from Localytics, like engagement analysis. Like Localytics um, is kind of a, a hybrid product that actually lead, like bleeds in more into the uh, marketing automation space as well. So they, they actually have attribution as well. So it, it, the, the vendor, vendor space is like relatively complex in that you know, not every provider fits neatly into like one particular box. Like often, like these providers are trying to do more stuff. Um, so <coughs> again, it makes your tech choices like slightly more complex. But in any case, you want to make sure that you're ticking certain of those boxes, whether it's with one tool or with several tools. So one thing which, uh, you know, it's again, pretty fundamental. I mentioned like experimentation, A-B testing. is like really kind of like core growth work. Um, <coughs> And yeah, there are various tools out there that'll help you do A-B testing on, on native mobile, so testing like whole features and things like this. Um, <coughs> now, when you're a very early stage startup, actually, or if you, you know, have, an, have a product that's like new in the market, it might be that you don't really have enough users to get st statistically significant like A-B tests done in a reasonable amount of time because you're just not getting enough traffic through the app. Um, so that's why I would say it's like this is one part of the the tech layer with that the maybe is less valuable or less useful for like really early uh, products. Like um, actually no like products that have been in the market a long time that's still not doing much native A-B testing. It's like a lot of people say that they should do it, but not that many people are actually doing it. Like, uh, and then like the really big guys, like the, the, the companies that have been around for, you know, more time and they have like, you know, millions of users and they have definitely enough um, you know, enough users to do like a lot of experiments, they typically build their own experimental framework. So they typically skip these kind of like tools like Optimize, Optimizely or Optimize. 
um, and go straight to like building their own framework, which can maybe <coughs> look at users not just on their mobile apps, but also on mobile uh, on web and like on other properties as well, and make sure that experimental groups are not like cross like polluting each other. Um, and then you get like you know if you can get that set up really well, then you get companies like Airbnb who are apparently running some crazy amount of experiments per week, like something like hundreds per week of different experiments across the platform, which is just nuts, but but really cool. Um, yeah, so these these kind of products can definitely help you, um, you know, if you want to just like A-B test product, uh, like product changes, um, but you need enough traffic to actually uh, like justify them. So it's, it's maybe something that comes a little bit later in the life cycle. Yeah, and then marketing automation SDKs. This is a very busy slide, like uh, no need to read it all. Um, it's really, this is just a timeline that I stole from uh, infographic, uh, basically because I wanted all of the... Uh, the providers there on the left, that's a pretty good roundup of uh, most of the marketing automation providers out there. So yeah, basically the timeline is just explaining that marketing automation came from just originally just sort of basically just doing basic push notifications through to like better segmentation and advanced behavioral and predictive analytics and through to better personalization um, to apparently in 2016 where it was all finished and it's now just like full service marketing automation, which uh, I, I don't think it's quite there yet actually, but um, definitely these tools are pretty cool um, and I'm a big proponent of them because like if you actually give your growth marketers a dashboard where they can segment users based on their behavior, target them with personalized messaging, um, A-B test these campaigns and iterate on them completely independently of your software release cycle. A, it like actually empowers those growth marketers to, to do a good job and actually drive your you know, growth numbers up and B, it frees up your developers to actually get on with like building more features or um, you know, increasing their like, app stability or whatever it is they're working on. Um, and they don't have to worry about like doing measurement and A-B testing and a lot of things which typically um, are the first things to kind of um, not be implemented fully or particularly well, things like reporting and things like that. You get a lot of this stuff out of the box with these kind of uh, full service tools. Um, but they're, they're not cheap either. So it's another consideration for for like an early stage company is to like you know can you afford like a mix panel or an app boy or localytics like they're really great tools but they're they're also quite expensive like i do see some companies kind of going for a sort of the really like low budget option things like firebase um which is a platform that google has been building out which gives you a lot of stuff for free actually it gives you basic analytics it gives you basic push notifications um deep linking with dynamic links um, you get a lot of stuff out of the box for free, so it actually ticks a lot of these boxes in the tech layer. Um, and I'm definitely not going to bash Firebase. I think it's great, but it's uh, it's also not it's not in this list for a reason because it's really it's much more bare bones. In fact, I think I yeah I I kind of put it over here in this this kind of bare bones section. This is sort of our attempt at feature to kind of segment the the mobile marketing automation space because it's, there's a lot of vendors out there. Um, <coughs> we've used most of them because like we, we work with a lot of clients all around the world they they, they have all, all kinds of different tech setups so that we've we've basically been working with most of these tools over the last sort of uh, six to twelve months um, and yeah I would say that firebase I, I put it there in brackets it's it's still beta now I, I don't think Google would say that it's still in beta but but that's that's our impression of it like it's still pretty rough and like you won't get a lot of stuff out of the box that you would get with one of these more kind of polished commercial products. But if you're on a really like tight budget, it's, it is one option. Okay, and then finally, monetization. Um, now, if, you've, if you're a paid app and that's how you monetize, then you don't really need to think about a monetization SDK. Um, similarly, if you're monetizing through in-app purchases only, um, or if you have like your own, your own native advertising setup, um, then maybe you don't need any kind of SDK in there at all for monetization. But if you want to run ads, like maybe uh, rewarded video, for example, which is a pretty good way to monetize, or just display ads or interstitials, you know, whatever it is, um, and you want to serve those ads, like basically get the, get those ads served via like an ad network. So basically, you just have to plug it in, and you basically get a paycheck. Um, then you'll need to plug in like a some kind of monetization SDK. Um, the the space is obscenely complex. Uh, this is not just monetization SDKs actually, but this kind of uh, mobile ad network space, like pretty much all of these would have an SDK for monetization. 
Um, <coughs> but there are some like mediation partners that can help simplify it. So if you plug in like a, a fiber or a, um, supersonic ads, then you basically get access to like the entire network and you can sort of plug in different partners and see which ones are performing best for you in terms of like wh which, which ads are actually like getting clicked on or interacted by your users and which ones are actually earning you money. So that's, that's pretty much my whistle-stop tour of the tech layer for, uh, for mobile apps. Uh, I said I'd leave some time for questions at the end, so yeah, hopefully there's some questions here. Uh, yeah, we have one over there. It's Ryan, yeah? Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions? I don't want to put you on the spot, please. You can put me on the spot, Ryan. That's okay. Um, for, for, for measuring LTV of subscription models. Okay, so um, your question is basically how do I figure out my LTV on subscription customers when I have a whole bunch of different subscription models and different pricing and different um, bundles and things like that? Is there and uh, is, is, is there any good tools out there for doing that? Uh, not that I'm aware of, <laughs> is the sad answer. Um, I think Eric Seufert um, is working on something in that direction. I think not so much for subscription, but more for like freemium LTV calculation stuff. Uh, but I think it's still in like closed alpha at the moment. Uh, I mean, usually subscription LTV is the easier one to calculate because it's like, you know, it's a bit more like guaranteed revenue. But um, no, I don't have any tools out there um, that, that would simplify that, that task for you. It's, uh, I, I have s sympathy. <laughs> uh, we had another one over here somewhere? Yeah. Um, you have this great example of your own deep linking. Um, uh, yeah, you're, so you're asking about the, uh, the, the deferred deep linking yeah. uh, scenario, whereby you can pass information through to the app after, after it's been installed. So basically pass, sub, like, get information to the, the app on the first session through the App Store. Yeah, um, yeah. basically works by um, fingerprinting, basically. Um, some kind of fingerprinting method, either by de ex exact device matching um, or by uh, creating a fingerprint of the, um, the device, basically using a whole bunch of different uh, signals, things like whatever it can read, basically, from the web browser. So yes, it, it basically it requires like a, a, a click which gets goes through the, the mobile web browser, um, at which uh, and then you basically land on a link which is managed by the server of whatever um, deep link provider you're using, so Branch or Yozio or maybe um, Adjust or AppsFlyer, for example. Um, so when the user clicks on the link, um, uh, it lands, it hits like a mobile website, which it pulls like as much information as it can about the user. It can't get the device ID, actually. It can't get like the IDFA because it's mobile web. Um, but it, it can get a whole bunch of different signals, which combined produce a pretty good fingerprint, which decays pretty rapidly over time. Um, so it's only valid, really f valuable for like a few hours um, or you know a day at best, uh, and then it really degrades in quality because a lot of the signals they're using are, are pretty temporary. Things like IP address, which can change quite a lot. Um, they even use things like uh, how much battery the, the device has, or like how strong the network is, or whether the user's on Wi-Fi or on. Um, are on cellular. Um, so like each of these signals on their own are really, really poor for like identifying a user. But if you can combine enough of them, then for a short time, they actually work very effectively for combining that user. So basically the user installs the app, they run the app, the SDK of the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, deep linking provider then <coughs> like basically collects those same pieces of information, creates that same fingerprint, fires it back to the server, and the server says whether it's got a match. And it, it actually, they, they also give you, like, whether it's a very, very definite match or if it's, like, an 80%, probably the same person. And then you can decide what to do with that information, whether you customize the experience or whether you fall back to uh, something more generic. Um, yeah, so typically if they install right away and then they launch the app right away, it works very well. If they, if they click on the link, they install the app, and then they go away and make a cup of tea and then you know, come back to it at the end of the day, probably it's not going to match. But typically, the, the deep linking provider will, will let you know so that you can, you can decide whether to trust, trust the fingerprint. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So the question is, um, 
yeah would like when you've got an existing user base would you build a native app versus a, a mobile optimized web uh yeah i would i'm i'm pretty strongly in favor of native app um simply because like i would say well like the, the short answer is let the data lead you although of course you can't really get the data until you've actually already built the app but i mean what we see everywhere with all of the all of the clients that we consult with at feature is that the native apps are more sticky than the mobile website and that's also what we saw at soundcloud to like a massive extent so soundcloud has a mobile web player um you can actually you know interact with the all of the content on soundcloud through the mobile web you don't need to install the mobile app uh, but what we saw at soundcloud was most people like something some massive percentage like 90 percent of people would would land on the mobile website and they would just bounce after listening to like one song whereas if we could get them to download the app they would be much more likely to come back and, and have like more sessions longer sessions they were stickier we could send them push notifications they they were they had a better experience um and they were much more likely to use the app again so i'd say just from a engagement point of view um definitely native app um however it's good to have mobile web app as well <laughs> because then you know it can be like a stage in that kind of engagement funnel it's another touch point with the user you might find some small percentage of users just want to stay on mobile web um but most of them you want to probably like upsell them fairly aggressively to native mobile um but you probably want some kind of content or functionality on 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 web anyway um just to be that like maybe first touch point plus you're like then more discoverable on search and a bunch of other things so so my answer is do both <laughs> um but focus on 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 native in terms of the investment but it's uh but yeah of course it costs money yeah. um but i think it's it's really pretty essential to to have a native app yep great question right so it's um yeah like what do i think about native apps and how they or, or mobile apps and how they'll change with voice assistants and ai and like conversational interfaces basically yeah um yeah it's uh it's a great topic i actually just bought a uh, amazon echo dot the other week uh so i'm i'm really getting into like um conversational interface stuff it's it's really cool um and you can and it's i think for a lot of applications it's already pretty interesting and and can be either replacing a lot of the kind of traditional input methods or you know be a great like addition to it i don't think it's universally the best approach for everything conversation i think um you know i think there will be you know there there are some apps if i think about them you know that are still like super visual um or you know just actually really quite enjoyable to interact with like like visually or or haptically uh i don't think that conversational interfaces are going to completely eradicate like apps in general but maybe certain classes of apps yeah um and it's it's also an interesting question of like if you have like a really super smart digital assistant that actually can do a lot of other stuff and and has and is smart enough to really understand your intent then actually maybe you don't need these other apps there at all because the digital assistant can go and do them for you so as you think it's going to be quite subversive for for brands that have spent a lot of time investing in their their brand and their presence and their their kind of their interface like if they are essentially all they're doing is ultimately providing some kind of transactional value then that transaction can easily be like subverted into basically like they become an API that just plugs into the uh, the conversational interface yeah yeah Um yeah so the question is like sort of to what extent do I think Firebase has a chance in the long term to to sort of unify a lot of this other stuff and to like yeah. yeah um unfortunately I'm not super confident that the Google's going to do this in a reasonable amount of time or that Google can do it I mean I know that they can technically I mean they they're big enough if they would put enough emphasis and effort and investment into really solving this problem for the for the app developers out there they kind of could you know and they are already making some fairly big steps into into the turf of some of these other third party providers like you know firebase dynamic links actually works pretty well it's pretty much as good as well like branch would kill me for saying that but yeah it's, it's it doesn't have as good uh, as good dashboarding as branch for sure but um you know in terms of the underlying technology it kind of works you know um and um 
Yeah, attribution, I think they've got a really long way to go. Like, I've, I've had a look at their attribution, the, the basic attribution they have in Firebase Analytics, and it's just, it really doesn't cut it. Um, I mean, they could they could do it through through purchase, right? If they would buy a Just or something like that, then the, suddenly they would have attribution, like, really nicely. Like, um, and I think that that's the only way that they'll really nail it, like, across the whole, like, or even across, like, most of that, that tech layer. Like, each of these these things, um, I mean, A-B test framework, deep linking, they're maybe a little smaller. Marketing automation is a huge, huge thing all on its own. Attribution is a pretty huge thing and it's been solved pretty well by these big four. Monetization, I think Google has a pretty good shot at it because they're already, you know, basically doing that for like all of their customers. Like, it would be the most logical plot that they could really like make plug and play. Analytics, Firebase analytics still sucks. <laughs> Um, maybe one day they'll they'll get it really great, but then I mean they had a lot of time to make Google Analytics great, and uh, I still don't really like that very much. Certainly not for mobile. Um, yeah, uh, I think I just shut that off. But uh, yeah, I think anyway I finished with the, the slides. Yeah, so yeah, my, basically my short answer is uh, I I don't think that they're going to get there with Firebase completely, but that's not to say that it shouldn't be part of the stack because I think it already provides quite a bit of value, and I think it will continue to add more value, but. I think pretty slowly. Thank Thanks.